This morning's message brought to you by Zyrtec. <laughs> I've uh, been battling the allergies. As most of you know, uh, last weekend, Samantha and Riley and Anna and I, we went down to Arizona. On our way back, we went through the Rocky Mountains, and as soon as we stepped out of the car in Durango, Colorado, in all those pine trees, it's like I swelled up like a puffer fish. It was still worth it, though. So much of God's creation so beautiful down there. We saw the Grand Canyon. The pictures don't do that justice. But, um, no, we, we went down there to see the best man at my wedding, a man that I've known longer than we've known our own siblings, and he was graduating from the Fire Academy in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, that was the coolest graduation ceremony I've ever seen. Um, there was so much honor and duty and respect, and, and um, they did a graduation video, a video of their classes, and it was cool seeing them in their fireman stuff and cutting holes in roofs for ventilation, climbing a really tall ladder and fighting fires and stuff, and it was the coolest graduation I've ever seen, but um, EMTs and firefighters and nurses, people like, um, like my best friend Kalen, they see a lot of horrific things take place in the world. They see a lot of death and destruction and mayhem caused by the sinful fall of man. It's all around us and they, they are face to face with it every day. Uh, if, if they're not careful, if we're not careful, um, we can get callous to it, desensitized to it. It's really a tragedy, a tragedy, the things that they see. Did you know that Murder rates in America over the past few years average roughly six per 100,000 population. I'm convinced that statisticians go X amount per 100,000 because it sounds better than to say on average, 20,000 people in America are murdered in homicides every year. Uh, that's almost as if to say the whole town of North Platte, practically the whole town of North Platte gets murdered every year. And uh, America's statistics actually aren't a, even a drop in the bucket to Central and South America's murder rates. In Mexico, that average is 25,000, or 25 per 100,000. They have a population two thirds the size of America. And they average 32,000 killings per year. Venezuela is 40 per 100,000. That's over 11,000 murders a year. Honduras, even smaller than Venezuela, has 36 per 100,000. All these countries are our neighbors to the south. You have to wonder how much of that's coming up to the north. Murder is not a new problem in the world. 620,000 people were killed in the American Civil War. Somewhere between 70 and 85 million people were killed in World War II. Hitler and the Nazis killed roughly an estimated 6 million Jews in the Holocaust. People have been killing each other for thousands of years, and you have to look no further than the fourth chapter of God's Word to read about the first murder. So if you would, please turn to Genesis chapter 4. And as you turn there, I will pray. Father, we pray that we wouldn't sugarcoat the truths of a sinful fallen world. We pray that we wouldn't speak your word just to tickle the ears and that we wouldn't be afraid to address the harsh realities of the destruction that sin causes, but that we would point people to your son, Jesus Christ, who is the only light in a dark world. May we reflect that light in a world with what we say and do. Help us to love our enemies and be faithful servants to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Genesis chapter 4, and for context, I'll just start reading in verse 1. We'll really focus on verses 8 through 16, and if there's time, we'll see how far we can get to wrap up chapter 4 and get into chapter 5 next time. But starting in verse 1, I'll read to verse 16. Chapter 4 of Genesis says, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. 
Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The world's first murder took place not long after the creation of the world. The first murderer was the first offspring of the image-bearer race, the first child of Adam and Eve. The murderer and the victim were not strangers. This wasn't a drive-by shooting or an artillery strike from 15 miles away. The murderer Cain killed his own brother, brothers that grew up together under the same roof, given the same parenting, played in the same backyard, shared meals together. How could a man kill his own brother? It's hard to fathom, let alone stomach it. Starting in verse 5, we begin to see Cain's psychotic, depraved spiral into the darkness of hate-filled anger. Let's just read verse 5 again. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. God rejected Cain's offering, not just because the offering was inferior to Abel's. It was inferior. It was an inferior offering because Cain's heart wasn't in it. Abel brought to God the best and first of what he had. Abel brought a blood sacrifice. demonstrating his humility and recognition that God is holy and the wages of sin is death. Cain brought an armful of vegetables. As we mentioned last time, Abel came to God on God's terms. Cain came to God pridefully on his own terms. Cain came to God the way the world comes to him, with false worship, false religion coming to God under the misconception that they are good enough to come into the presence of God just the way they are. God's acceptance of Abel's offering and rejection of Cain's wasn't personal, but Cain took it personally. Why did Cain take it personally? Because in his fallen pride, Cain thinks everything's about him. God did not show partiality to Abel. God cannot show partiality. And if you would, keep your finger in Genesis 4, but turn over quickly with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Just a couple quick verses. Looking at verse 34 and 35. Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35 reads, Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. God is saving people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. 
He's not partial to the Jews. He doesn't save us because we're Americans. God's enemies should fear him, but they don't. God saves people from any nation, those that fear him, and do right. Doing right is the same as bearing fruit. All believers bear fruit. It's an evidence of genuine salvation. But what does Peter mean when he says, those that fear God? This fear means having a reverence for him. Holding God and his truth in such a high regard that it manifests a change in our desires and behaviors. To fear God is to have a deep-seated respect for who he is and what he says and that we desire to do good and serve him faithfully. To fear God is not to be scared of him. As believers, we know that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is trustworthy and gracious. That's not to say that he won't uh, scourge us, chasten us, excuse me, like the loving father chastens the son whom he loves. He will chasten us to purge and purify us, but he will never leave us nor forsake us. But God's enemies should fear him. They are only afraid of the consequences of their sinful actions, as we will see in Cain in a minute. So God welcomes any person who fears him and does what is right. Now turn back to Genesis chapter 4 if you haven't already. Cain does not fear God. Look at the sinful pride in this man. Let's read again verses 5 through 7. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well... Sin is crouching at the door and its desires for you, but you must master it. Face to face with the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one and only living God, and Cain shows defiance. Cain and his offering of plants aren't good enough. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The wages of sin is death. It must be paid with blood. Cain came to God and expected to be able to dwell in his presence without the shedding of blood. It is impossible. God rejects Cain's offering and Cain gets angry about it. Cain doesn't fearfully repent, but instead... He gets angry at God. But look at how God responds so graciously and patiently. He says, Cain, why are you angry? Just do right and you'll find joy, but if you don't, then the sin of anger will overtake you and you will spiral further into sin and it will destroy you. Cain doesn't heed God's word. Instead, look at verse 8. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Cain dishonored God with his offering, got angry at God, didn't listen to God, but instead boiled in his anger to the point of killing his own brother. And then in verse 9, he lies to God. Read verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? This is the cold-blooded response of a psychopath. Cain has been completely given over to depravity. To boil in your rage to the point of killing your own flesh and blood and then to lie to the Almighty God to his face. No shred of fear, only satanic pride. And yet again, how does God respond? Shouldn't God be the angry one? God would have every right and be fully justified to sentence Cain to death and execute him on the spot. But what does he do? Read 10 through 12. God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. I'm so sick and tired of hearing that God, the God of the Old Testament, is a God of wrath. That statement is purely ignorant. Every breath we take is a grace from God. 
Look at God's gracious judgment on the murderer. You'll get to keep on living. Have a wife of your own. Have children of your own. Things you robbed your brother Abel of. But you will wander the face of the earth desperate for your every meal because you will no longer have success in farming. Cain in his pride thought that he had no need for God in his counsel. As long as he could farm the land, he was self-sufficient. He had no need of anyone. God takes Cain's farming ability from him. Every day that Cain farms the ground in vain would be a reminder of the day he killed his brother and spilled his brother all over, his blood all over the ground. Look at Cain's response to God's judgment in verses 13 and 14. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So what does Cain do in response to God's judgment? He complains. This punishment is too harsh. I don't deserve this. Really? You murdered your brother in cold blood. You get to keep your life for a while longer, but this judgment is too harsh? From your face I will be hidden. Cain knows that he will never again be graced with God's presence and his protection. Now he has to face the world alone, wandering the earth, seeking that which he can never have. Joy and peace and love and all the blessings that come from God and his presence. He will seek for joy and never have it. He will seek for peace and never grasp it. He will search for love and never find it. Not true love. He will get the world standard of love at best that leaves you longing for more. Perhaps one day Cain would realize his need for God and repent. Until then, he will wander the earth looking over his shoulder, sleeping with one eye open, afraid that someone will come along and murder him like he did his own brother. So God gives Cain a grace in response in verse 15. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. God doesn't retract his judgment. He doesn't completely eliminate the possibility that someone could come along and kill him. God promises sevenfold vengeance on anyone who would murder Cain. And he appoints a sign on Cain to discourage others from killing Cain. This sign is not dark skin. Let's crush that misconception before we move on. In the past, some unbiblical churches taught that the mark on Cain was dark skin and they would use this as justification for the African slave trade and for segregation and racism. That is purely unbiblical. We simply aren't told what the mark was, and that is not even the point of the passage. To read into it, racist justification is disgusting and wrong and shameful. Moving on to verse 16. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And here, in my personal studies, was a good example of why it's a good idea to go back to the original source languages of the Bible if you're going to do a deep study in a passage of Scripture. I love my NAS 95 and how it reads. Not much for Shakespeare. But the King James Version is actually more accurate in this passage, and it really makes a difference in how the passage is understood. Even with the King James, you should go back to the original languages, uh, the original Hebrew and Greek the NAS and ESV reads that Cain settled in the land of Nod. Well, settled to me means that he must be done wandering then, right? So he's done with God's curse of being a vagrant and a wanderer. He settled down in the land of Nod. The Hebrew word is actually yeshav, which means dwelt. Cain existed in the land of Nod. He dwelt there. And the Hebrew word for node literally means wandering of aimless fugitive, exile. Look at verse 17. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. 
Then he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Cain and Mrs. Cain knew each other as only they should know each other and had a son named Enoch. There are two big questions at this point. First, who were the people, backing up just a little bit, who were the people that Cain was afraid would kill him at this point? And two, where did his wife come from? Genesis chapter 5 verse 4 says that Adam had other sons and daughters. Adam was 130 years old when he became the father of his third son, Seth. He lived another 800 years after that, and it says he had other sons and daughters. 800 years of baby making could make a lot of babies. Cain was afraid of his brothers or sisters killing him, and Cain's wife was his sister. We know that Cain married his sister because all humans are descended from Adam and Eve. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as the, through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. God used one man and one woman to procreate the entire human race. We have all inherited Adam's sin nature. We all need God's forgiveness that comes only through Jesus Christ. This is a truth the world loves to attack, because in our day, what happens if close relatives interbreed? Major irreversible birth defects. This was a common problem in royal families that would seek to keep their royal bloodline pure by not marrying outside the family. King Tut, one of the most famous Egyptian pharaohs, had many diseases and birth defects, and historians believe he was a product of incest. The Habsburg dynasty was one of the most powerful ruling families in Europe's history. At one point, the Habsburgs ruled the Holy Roman Empire and the Spanish Empire. Desperate to keep power within the family, the Habsburgs would marry first cousins and uncles would marry their nieces. It is estimated that from 1516 to 1700, 80% of the Habsburg marriages were interbred, were inbred. Google a picture of Charles II of Spain. He was the last monarch of the Habsburg line, could not produce an heir with either of his two wives, and died at the age of 38. So how do we as Christians defend the fact that Cain married his sister, yet we see plenty of evidence of the damage inbreeding causes to offspring? Adam and Eve had perfect DNA. But as a result of the fall, the curse of death infected our DNA, our very makeup. This caused the DNA to replicate itself incorrectly, causing defective genes. The problem with incest is that both parents pass down the same defective genes to their kids, and the defects multiply and replicate and compound the health issues caused by the defects. This problem compounds generation after generation, but in the beginning, their DNA was relatively free of abnormalities. When God revealed his law to the Israelites in Leviticus 18, he forbids incest of any kind. Let's read verse 17 again. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And then part B, he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> At some point, Cain stopped from his wanderings long enough to build a city. Clearly, by this time, there were enough people on the earth to need a city. But notice that he names his son Enoch and names the city after Enoch and not himself. Cain was cursed to wander, but built a city for his son Enoch so that Enoch could have a place to settle down. And this isn't the same Enoch that we read about in chapter 5. This is a different Enoch. There's two Enochs in these two chapters. And now we will be shifting away from Cain in the next section of chapter 4. Let's read verses 18 through 24. Now to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad became the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabel, 
He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal-Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. <coughs> Sorry. Need more Zyrtec. If Cain's pride was sevenfold, then Lamech's pride was seventy-sevenfold. In verse 19, we see that one wife wasn't good enough for Lamech. He needed two. Lamech's first wife, Ada, gave birth to Jabel. Jabel's people were nomadic shepherds in the time that Moses was writing this for the Israelites. Jubal is known as the father of musicians that play string and wind instruments. Lamech's second wife, Zillah, gave birth to Tubal-Cain and Nama. Tubal-Cain was a blacksmith. Look at the pride that Lamech has when he addresses his wives. He refers to himself in the third person. This is a show of arrogance. He claims to have not only murdered one man, but a boy as well, and he vows vengeance on whomever would kill him ten times that of the vengeance of Cain. Read 25 and 26. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also, a son was born, and he called him Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Here we see that Adam and Eve had a third son named Seth. Seth is seen as a replacement for Abel. Eve even says so. She says, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel. Seth was a spiritual replacement for Abel as well. After Seth was born, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That is to say that men were preaching. You'll notice the overall flow of chapter 4 and 5, that Cain has his line, is, is really a parenthesis in the middle of the flow of Adam's descendants. Cain's lineage, by and large, is depicted as spiritually dead, and ultimately his line was wiped out in the flood. Chapter 5 picks up with Adam's line through Seth. There are some godly men mentioned in the lineage of Seth, but by and large, by chapter 6, the godly men are only a remnant, and mankind is characterized as wicked prior to the flood of Noah's day. Murderers like Cain and Lamech are examples of the result of sinful depravity. The most heinous murder in all of human history was the murder of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Fully God, fully man, Jesus Christ wasn't a helpless victim, but rather he gave his life willingly to redeem fallen men from the consequences of their sins. Turn with me to John chapter 3, starting in verse 16. I think we can all quote the first verse of John 3.16, but I want to read through verse 21. John 3, starting in 16, going to 21, says, <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, <coughs> but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. <coughs> But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested. 
as having been wrought in God. Men like Lamech loved the darkness rather than the light, like most people of the world do. They travel on the broad path that leads to destruction. Let us as God's people love the light and shine his light into a dark and dying world. Let us give the world that is wrought with school shootings, wars and rumors of wars, the only hope that is Jesus Christ. Things in this world are spiraling from bad to worse. Without Christ, what hope is there? There is none. Let us be bold to share Christ. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, I do pray that we are bold to share Jesus Christ. <coughs> we are blessed to have EMTs and firefighters and police officers as a, a grace and a help in desperate, dark times. But Lord, ultimately, even if they save people from calamities to live another day, eventually all men will die. And Lord, we just pray that the gospel would go out because the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, who was murdered to save your people from their sins, he is the only hope of everlasting life. May we be bold in sharing him and bless this day of fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>